Clog TV. Beyond the Policy. I won't admire. I admire myself in the mirror. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sure. Yes. Do you know? Oh, don't worry. We are now for Busumbia. Me, I'll mind you in the Busumu. Please speak. Speak, speak. Hi. Pardon. Yeah, please talk into the mic so that you can... Hi, can you hear me? Oh, it's my voice too. Hi. 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 Hello. Hi. Hi. Yeah, bring in a... Hi. Leave it alone. It's too low. Hello. It's too low. Oh, you're, you're disturbing me. <laughs> Hello. Hey, hey. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Yeah, so... What we do
is downloading. Uh -huh. Brittany Taichi Foundation. Up to where? Was it women and children? Welcome back to the Coco Digest Morning Show. If you are just tuning in, this is the Coco Digest Morning Show and you missed some amazing segments, especially the lifestyle segment on friendship. But not to worry, you can always stream it on Facebook or YouTube. You can just watch the playback and then learn something today. Now it's time for our main discussion and I have here with me Miss Brittany Techi, and she is the founder and CEO of the Brittany Techi Foundation. And today we will be discussing the importance of regulations and self governance in the NGO sector, as well as touching a little bit on how NGOs run and the projects that she has also undertaken with her foundation. So let me read a little background to the Brittany Techi Foundation. And so the Brittany Techi Foundation is a non-profit organization dedicated to empowering marginalized communities in Ghana, founded by our very own Ms. Brittany Techi. And their mission is to provide essential resources and support to underprivileged individuals, particularly children and women. So let's meet her and let's get interactive. So hello, Ms. Brittany. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm happy to be here. Yes. So you run the Brittany Tichi Foundation. Yeah. How long has it been? Um, right now, fourth year. You're in your yes. fourth year. Okay. So can you give us just a little history of the Brittany Tichi Foundation? What inspired it? I mean, your mission and vision has already given us some <laughs> kind of background or insight into it. But what inspired? Um, I would say my parents. So okay. my parents used to run a youth shelter when I was a child. Okay. Yeah, in the early 2000s. Okay. And I also had it to actually continue the good work that they had been doing. Okay. Yeah, so somewhere, then when I was in SHS, I used to see little children working barefooted and things. And yeah. Then. So I also decided that I'll take it upon myself to do some projects that would actually help these little okay. ones. So in 2020, I started planning and then... In 2021, we had our first project. Okay. Before we get into the project, how do you even start an NGO? Yeah. So um, first, it's on you, the person, okay. to be dedicated. Mm -hmm. And then you can ask, start little by little, okay. either volunteering, helping mm -hmm. in church projects, okay. helping our work, then little by little. But then... Um, if you want it to be sustained, it has to be more or less formalized. Okay. So you come up with a group of others. Mm -hmm. You start projects visiting whichever area you choose to work on. Mm -hmm. And then you go ahead with your registration. That okay. is this. So do you just get up and start projects or you have to, there's some rigorous processes you need to follow? Um, so... We don't just get up and okay. start projects. Uh, we mostly do research, mm -hmm. which is groundwork, I okay. call it. Yeah, so depending on what we want to do, yeah, we do research. If we're working on schools, it means that we have to go to the vicinity, mm -hmm. scout for the schools. Yeah. And with the schools like this, you also have to go to the district office yeah. of education for the school because you need a permission letter okay. from them. Yeah, so... Okay. so do you do you just come together and decide okay we are an NGO or you go to like maybe some center for NGO registration for or something are there you know regulatory bodies that you need to consult to officially become an NGO? 
Yes, um, you need to register with the um, register of companies, and then you need to also mm -hmm. get, um, for most organizations, you need to also get uh, social welfare okay. registration as well. Yeah. Okay. So these are the two main things you yeah, need to two get. Main. Okay. So are there any other bodies that you like based on let's say our legal terms, like in the legal aspects where in the books or in theory this is what's supposed to happen, even though it may not be happening. Are there any other legal bodies that you need to consult? Um yes. So depending on the area or what you want to work on, sometimes you have to work mm -hmm. with the traditional authorities. Yeah. Some cases you have to involve the police. Okay. And well, it's it's like every sector and what needs to be done. Okay. Like sometimes you even have to involve standard authority, authority as okay. well. Yeah. So it's every project and then the order okay. of command you need to follow. Okay. Yeah. So, cherished viewers, please be reminded that our phone lines are open. You can call and then ask your questions. You can send in your text messages, your shout-outs, your suggestions, your questions as well. We'll read them. And then Ms. Brittany Tichi would also answer these questions for you. So, yes, back to this NGO. So, do you have a license or the license to, does it expire? Do you have to renew? Because, I mean, a lot of us just know of NGOs, but we don't know what actually goes into NGOs. Um, so, um, yes, there is the company certificate okay. and then the social welfare. And you also have to, like, even though it's a non-profit, you mm -hmm. have to file your taxes, which okay. will be no, no, but then you have to always keep in touch with the company, uh, the, the registry department. Okay. Yeah. So what exactly goes into it? Let's see. When you have this NGO and you are going to register, what are the processes you go through with, let's say, the registry, the taxes, and then even the other bodies that you need to consult with that, okay, we are an NGO and we may be needing your assistance? Um, so first of all, I would say there's a lot of paperwork. Okay. When you go to the Registrar General Department, mm -hmm. like the forms that you have to fill to get, <laughs> like sometimes people are unregistered and then I understand <laughs> because <laughs> the paperwork that you have to do, like about data, ten mm. house address, all those things, yeah. and then auditors and accountants and all those yeah. that you actually need all those people okay. before you can actually formally and legally register okay. the company. After that, you move to social welfare. Mm -hmm. And you know how these things can be in this country. So it's like, I don't know, they have to like constantly chase people, yeah. department after department. Okay. But then it's actually worth it having it, um, having it registered. Mm -hmm. Some people will not deal with you at all. So yes. far as you are not able to use evidence of your registration, okay. There are people that you want to work with, like foreign bodies, and always the first question is, are you registered? Yeah. Even if you go to a school, any community you go to, the first question is, are you registered? Because at the end of the day, if anything goes by, it mm -hmm. is only your registration or your legalization that can indemnify them. Yeah. So to, like you go to a school, they are like, well, they understand everything that you want to do, but then they want to see your, your certificate okay. before they can go ahead to deal with you. Okay, so... Uh, would you say even the chasing, uh, some of the challenges that you have to face, if you can even shed some light on some of the challenges your NGO faces? Yes, so um, sometimes you have to chase after people. Okay. Like It's like after that, in everything that we do, we're always chasing after okay. one person or the other. And sometimes it makes projects slow. Mm -hmm. Like there are some projects that you want to do a certain project. I remember somewhere 20... 22, we wanted to do a, a school project. Mm -hmm. and so I went to the school and they were like, I should go to the education district. And so I think the first day I went, the person wasn't there. And then the second day too, I, I had exams, so I, I couldn't really make okay. it in time. And then, you know, when you delegate to, yeah. they are not able to find the right person. So that project was actually stalled because of the yeah. procedures that we had to follow. And then I asked if the school couldn't like, take care of those processes for us. And they mm. were like, no, for them, they also have their jurisdiction okay. in them. So you have to, like, follow everyone. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So aside having to chase people, are there any governmental policies or rules here in Ghana that sort of hinder, you know, in the work fast, fast, doing it quick, quick, and the progress, basically? 
Um, yes, well, there are some projects that when you when you set out to do them, mm -hmm. you might have some barriers. Mm -hmm. Because let's say if you are doing a project that involves the police, yeah. you, let's say a child is missing and then they, you are the one that they bring it to. You actually have to go to the police station. They have to issue a missing persons report. Mm -hmm. And then in some cases, they will tell you that it can't be filed until after 48 hours. Okay. So. You, you, you're also waiting for them to act yes. before you can also act. Yes, so all those are... So those are some of the things that yeah. hamper. Okay. So back to your NGO. Can you tell us a little bit about the body or the management? You know, so from management down to the last person, how is it structured? Okay, so there are the, there are the directors, then okay. there is the secretary, and then we have um, project leads for... Um, our menstrual hygiene campaign, okay. our education project, and then our orphanage drives, and then okay. food and shelter. Yes, and then under that, we have the communications team. Okay. They more assist the secretary, okay. and then there's the PR, who, who are actually in charge of our social media handles, okay. and then we have the volunteers who come abo aboard when we are having projects. Okay. So you didn't mention accounts. Oh, sorry. Yeah, there, <laughs> yes, there's that of... <laughs> account so okay. we have um someone who keeps a uh, mobile money number okay. and they okay. work closely with the directors okay and they also work with the secretary because mostly when we have projects they are supposed to print the statement yes. and then after they make um, the budget and then the expense sheet okay. yes or for record keeping okay so between okay so between mobile money and then bank accounts which one would you say is more Efficient. Um, mobile money, yeah. <laughs> mobile money. Okay, it's so we efficient. have a caller on the line. Hello. Hello. Hello, good morning. Your name and where you're calling from, please. Hello, I'm sorry. I'm calling from um, Tessie. Your name is? I said I'm, I'm Joy. I'm calling from Tessie. Joy. Okay, you're calling from Tessie. Yes, please. Okay, what's your question, please? Yeah, um, I just want to find out about um, when someone to start like an orphanage program, basically for the youth. Uh huh. You want to find out? Yeah, what I, exactly? like an orphanage program, like an NGO mm -hmm. orphanage program, basically for the youth. Mm -hmm. Because we see by now we get um, like how a lot of a youth that. Uh, like uh, teenage pregnancy, and you are yes. not able to take care of themselves. Yes. So you're getting a kid. Most of them, like, I do find challenges. Like, okay, when you want to start a program, you can go to the police and take some forms. You can give me the child mm -hmm. because I know you can't take care of the child. Give me the child, and I will. Like, you can come at any time. You won't, but they find me difficult to give up the children. Okay. And have, I don't know how they will go about this. Or who to me, I, I don't know. I, I get so, so confused about everything. Mm -hmm. Okay. So ask me, yeah, so that how was, it. Okay. Yes, sir? So we'll ask me, no. Brittany, how to go about it. Yes, please. Okay. So I think she wants to know about <clears throat> having this, I think it's related to the shelter thing we were discussing, yeah. to having this shelter for the youth, you know, the orphans and things like that, where some of them get pregnant and they cannot even take care of the child. So I think it's along those lines. It wasn't very clear. Yeah. But so something like that, how would the Brittany Teachy Foundation go about it? Um, so if I'm um, to be clear, she wants to like take the child from the teenage yes, mother. Some, I think a place for like them to be able to. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if it has been lifted now, but then I think there was a ban on adoptions in Ghana for oh, some time. Okay. I'm not sure if it has been lifted. But I see the thing with the child and teenage pregnancy is the girl should be the parents or the mother should be willing to give out her child okay. in the first place which in most cases they are not willing to mm -hmm. and also with that with the cost study <laughs> you know like we're living in the real world what yes. what is the guarantee that you are not going to sell my child or yes, you're actually yeah. going to take care of the child so what normally happens i've witnessed in shikana orphanage which is at dawa is 
she takes teenage pregnant mothers mm -hmm. as well and then she keeps them in the orphanage along okay. with the children so that the child can actually grow up and that one the, the girl is at liberty to either live or leave or leave with the child or okay. leave and then leave the child behind depend because you can't hold the person yes. hostage if the person doesn't want your help yeah there's you nothing you can do, do about anything. it yeah but it seems there may not be a lot of that we find with these ngos maybe donations and things but you don't like the one you yeah. just mentioned i'm not sure a lot of people even know about it where there is a shelter for these teenage pregnant mothers or expectant mothers people who cannot fend for themselves yeah. that are pregnant so maybe Maybe Brittany Teaching <laughs> Foundation will do something for us very soon. <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> so, yes, how do you also, you know, solicit for funds, being a non-governmental organization? Yes, so um, we have um, the common one, which is the crowdfunding. Okay. And then we also have the sponsorship letters from to okay. either organizations okay. or persons or bodies. And then sometimes, too, you get people um, willing to sponsor the whole project. Mm -hmm. So... Once okay. you roll it out, they are willing to sponsor the whole project. For our last uh, menstrual health hygiene project, mm -hmm. it was sponsored by students from University of Southern Florida in oh, the USA. Okay. They were in Ghana for their community-based learning, and then I worked with them by providing information on menstrual health with them. Okay. And they also um, they also took part in an annual part campaign by okay. sharing some flyers for the for the girls. So when they were leaving. And we, when they were leaving, we had just rolled out the Empower Hair Pass Drive. Okay. And then they asked for the budget, and then they just decided to sponsor the whole project. Oh, so, nice. yes. So, apart from that, yeah, so we do the crowdfunding sponsorship. And then sometimes too, there's also the opportunity to write for grants okay, as well. Okay. So, what are some of the challenges you face in you know, soliciting for funds? Um, so, uh, with the funds, sometimes it wouldn't flow in as expected. Sometimes okay. you send sponsorship letters and then you don't get any response okay and also the delay because mm -hmm. if you are raising let's say ten thousand ghana cities and then your goal is to raise it within two or three months mm -hmm. you can't be guaranteed that it yes. would come in so sometimes it stores the project okay. you realize that maybe the project is almost a week or two away but then you are not yet yeah, at your target yeah. so you might have to shift it back okay. yeah so what about with liaison with government institutions how easy or how difficult is it with um, government institutions, we don't normally don't have funds. to okay. liaise with them. But then, yeah, with the difficult part, there's always you always have to like paperwork. Yes. See this person, write to this office, and you know how chasing paperwork yes, in Ghana. That's yeah, true. so yeah, so there's also that stress of chasing office and okay. office. So, what are some of your goals for the? Brittany Tichi Foundation. Okay, so um, we are very committed to ending period poverty in Ghana, Thank in you. Africa, and then the world. So we have a lot of um, period poverty programs within the year. Okay. And we also want to ensure that um, orphanages are well fed and also have excess food supply Thank always you. for orphans. And we're also committed to ensuring that by 2030, we'll actually have a youth shelter for um, homeless okay. youth persons in Ghana. So we're working towards that. Okay. okay, that's that's really, really beautiful. So these projects you've mentioned or these goals, how do you intend to make them sustainable? So for the sustainability with the menstrual health and hygiene campaign, mm. we're currently having talks on um, making use of reusable pads, okay. menstrual cups, that is to do away with the sanitary pads yes. and then the single-use sanitary pads and stuff. And also with our school projects, we actually plan that we would actually have like scholarships or we either scholarships or a forum where when students are enrolled into it, it's not just like a one-time experience okay. for them, but they can actually depend on it throughout their yeah, academic. Prime, okay. yeah, academic. So how do you involve other beneficiaries and even other NGOs in your projects? Yes, uh, we do a lot of collaborations, mm -hmm. especially with the menstrual health and hygiene. Yeah. We're always working with other NGOs who are also in the same field. And also with um, other stakeholders for our school projects, we mm -hmm. have a few publishers on board who okay. are willing to actually support with the 
printing of exercise books for Thank the you. students and, and staff. And also with the orphanage project, we're currently on talk with some farmers mm -hmm. so that they would be able to um, give excess produce okay. or some part of their produce to orphanages to keep them active and running. All right. Thank you so much. We'll be taking a short break. So, yes, it's getting really, really interesting here with Miss Brittany Tichy. She's telling us all about her NGO and how it's managed, everything about running an NGO. But we'll be taking a short break. Right after the break, we'll go into the projects and learn about the menstrual health campaign, the back to school campaign, and all the other campaigns that she's had so far. And so that if you are also looking for an NGO to join, you can contact her and be a volunteer help your society. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Coco Digest Morning Show. If you're just tuning in, we are having a conversation with Ms. Brittany Tichi, the CEO of the Brittany Tichi Foundation. And they are an NGO that is committed to empowering women and children in the lives of everyone in the society. So we were learning about how to run an NGO, how an NGO faces all those legal issues. But now we're about to talk about the projects that they have undertaken and some of the things they intend to undertake as well. So yes, also be reminded that you can call in, ask your questions, send your suggestions, send your comments to our Facebook and YouTube live stream and our WhatsApp number on your screens. So yes, Miss Brittany, your back to school project, can you tell us about it, what it's all about? Um, so the back to school project focuses on ensuring that students have the right stationery that okay. they need because um, basic school is free in mm -hmm. most places like the government schools yes. so we work more with the government schools okay. in rural or un underprivileged communities mm -hmm. so we ensure that they have the books and then the stationery that they okay. need to actually thrive in school um currently we're doing our research around opetekwe which is somewhere down Suman. Okay. And the team went there about three weeks ago scouting for mm -hmm. scouting for a school for our next project. And then for the research that they did, mm -hmm. some of the schools there, even though it's in a crowd were inaccessible. Like yeah. you can't take the a car to is get that there. Bad. It's like there's no road. I don't know if you know how Deep, deep Accra chocolate houses are Eesh. passed through someone's backyard, yeah. someone's front porch before you get to the school. Wow. And then, like, I, I would have shared the pictures with you, but then it, it just came in. And then okay. I'm, I'm, I was asking them, So, is this really Accra? And they're like, they play. Wow. Yeah. So, so there, are, there are places here, even in Accra, that yeah. are like rural areas. Wow. Very rural. So, <laughs> and then. We went so per their research. Sometimes, if um, let's say a JHS people need twenty mm -hmm. exercise books, to like sometimes the parents can only afford five. Yeah, and then the five they split it within all the twenty. Yeah. So it's either they do three. I don't even know how they. Oh manage. yes, we we used to do. You divide the book into four, four <laughs> different subjects. Then you fold the page. Yeah. And <laughs> you write English science, yes, yeah. Yes. So I think that's how they are. And then for JHS, you can tell it's a bit bizarre yeah. as what is at stake because mm -hmm. at the end of their three years, they are you busy. To, yeah. yeah, they have to compete with other people from well-to-do yeah. families and well-to-do areas. So we try to bridge the gap there by okay. helping them with those their stationaries and stuff. So okay. in either September or October, we will be we will be having a back to school project around Opetekwe okay. in Dansuman. Okay. Yeah. So the back to school project are the things you provide limited to just books and stationery or maybe you help some of them with some uniforms or shoes, school bags as well. Yes. Um so Sometimes you get to the school and then, mm -hmm. so mostly when we get to the school during the research, the head and teachers lay down the problems okay. that they are facing. And sometimes it transcends beyond the stationery. Sometimes okay. it's the school bags, uniforms and yeah. things. And other times they report cases of 
let's say teenage pregnancy yes. preventing like girls from coming mm -hmm. to school and also in the fishing communities they said because most families are fisher folks sometimes the boys don't come because yeah. they follow their fathers to fish and something like that so sometimes they they want us to add maybe a talk segment yeah. with them try to like encourage them let them know what's at stake because they said that the teachers that they are there with them they, they say it every day but then mm -hmm. it's like it's it like, just passes yeah, here and go there but then they said something when outside people yes. come to talk to them at least they see some improvement yeah, yeah. <laughs> before they abandon it after <laughs> months later yeah. so yeah okay okay so it's not limited but, to just yeah like, i'm actually glad that your foundation is open to because there are certain people that we've decided this is what we are doing, this is what we are doing whether it is going to benefit them in the long run or not. But I'm glad that at least you listen to the needs of the people yeah. and then you're able to help them out. So aside the inaccessible <laughs> schools and things yeah. like that, what are some of the other challenges for the Back to School project? So for the Back to School <coughs> project, um, sometimes liaising with GES. Okay. Because you cannot do any project in any school without informing GES. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you go to the school and even like the head is not even willing to talk to you like you say good morning and they don't want to continue because they say sometimes you know people talk yes before you know they are in the news or something that mm -hmm. their school is this their school is that meanwhile maybe GES is not even away okay so sometimes I went to we went to a school around the Jamestown lighthouse area mm -hmm. and then the Headmistress made it known to us that even before she can even tell you anything about the school, mm -hmm. she needs to have a signed letter accompanying you from GES. Oh, okay. That they have GES is aware of you and they have given you permission okay. to talk to her. So why does GES need to be involved in this? Uh, <laughs> because don't they already have the database of the schools in Ghana and you know all the information about them and they do but then you know i would say to save to save face in case of anything because <laughs> if you got a report that a school does not have water a mm -hmm. school does not have food for yeah, the students i don't know that they will come back to gs yeah so okay. yeah so okay yeah so getting get so is getting the letter from g is also very difficult as well oh it's not difficult okay. it, it's not it's not really difficult you just have to you know this is ghana yes yeah. <laughs> so in situations where the school you mentioned Okwete Man, right? Oh, uh, uh, that's what the, the, the name is. The, the, it's in Okwete Kwe. Ah, uh, the area. Kwe. <laughs> so, in situations where a school in that area yeah. is basically inaccessible, and then you go to GS and they want to save face and they say, no, don't go there. You dare go, go to another school. Yeah. How would you navigate something like that? If they say you don't, you can't go there, mostly, what, what it means that you cannot go and do anything you are doing in the name of the school. So if you would navigate for me in such a case, I'd rather go and see the families. Because okay. if I come to you that I want to give your child a school bag, I don't think yeah, you would say no. Yeah. So for me in such cases, so I, I, I'd, rather go the, I'd rather go about the vicinity, asking okay. the families. And then it's not that. So for, for, I don't think that um, a, body stop, a body shouldn't be able to stop you from doing mm -hmm. what you want to do. So far as it's not illegal. Yes. But we're in Ghana. Yeah. Mm. So if you can go the long way and then go through the community, yes. visit homes, and then get it done. Yeah. I don't know that they will still be in the classroom. Okay. So I like the fact that also it's not just it's not necessarily even about the publicity of no. it. It's basically helping them because you mentioned that you'd rather go and find the families because yes, that's the main goal. <laughs> yeah. Finding these people and helping them, whether it's publicized or not, that is no. secondary. Yeah. I like that very much. Yeah. And we thank you. We the citizens of Ghana <laughs> and Upete <laughs> Queen. We say a big thank you to you. Yeah. So let's get into your orphanage drives. Okay. Can you tell us about that too? Um so with the orphanage drives we Actually, we want to help um, the directors of orphanages run their orf orphanages by providing the essential items, clothing, toiletries, mm. food. Okay. Yes, yeah, so um, we think we have visited about four to five orphanages since okay. 2020. Yes. And then some orphanages, well, it interests you to know that there are specific orphanages for specific sets of people. Okay. There is an orphanage around Dromi Kwabinya that I cannot mention their name because okay. there's this particular issue whereby they have about 50% of their children living with HIV AIDS. Okay. And they, so, and they are all there. So for them, it's, 
It's a normal orphanage, yeah. but then at the end of the day, they have their peculiar issues. Yes. And when we visited them in 2022, then one of the problems they had was they not getting um, the HIV vaccines yeah, for yeah. the children, okay. which I found a bit alarming because even though there are children living with the disease, with the, with the HIV virus, yes. they may not fully know how to yeah. go about it. And they go to normal schools. So mm -hmm. you know how school children are. Today, yes. one person is hurt. The Tomorrow, other person is yes. So I was actually expecting the National AIDS Commission to actually be on their necks every yes. day, ensuring that they are taking their drugs. And then the man told us that, no, like the AIDS Commission literally doesn't care about them. When they write for drugs and stuff, it takes oh, years. And he also appalling. had the problem of sometimes the drugs, they, he even had the money to buy the drugs, and then sometimes there are no drugs. Aye. Yeah, so... All those problems is it so okay. so it means that your foundation would have to go and maybe even visit with them and then find out the quantity of drugs they need so you will go and get it for them. Is this is that something part of yeah, your so, initiative? So the thing is when you go to them for, for us we believe that once we come to you it's not just about what we are coming to we, what we are bringing in mm -hmm. but also what your problems are. Yeah. And so we try to, in cases where we can't help, we try to link them with people or other organizations mm -hmm. that can help. Okay. Yes. And then for the other orphan, with, so normally we take a whole pile of clothing yeah. for clothing donations. Like sometimes you, I'll just be there and they'll be receiving calls yes. that, oh, we want to donate clothes, even though we don't have a project. Yeah. And then thanks to my mother's container in the house, <laughs> I always accept them. Yeah. Like no matter where you are, I'll come for them. So we dispatch all these clothes to the orphanages and mm -hmm. then also collecting toiletry supplies and mm -hmm. then the most importantly food <laughs> because yes. even if you are three in the house, look at the amount of food that you consume yeah. in a short period and then there are orphanages. I think Shakina had about 70 children. 70? Yeah, and then another orphanage on the Insawem Road had about almost 100 children and then the one around Dome Kwabenya, they have about... 60 to 70 as well. Yeah. So just look at the number of mouths that they are feeding. Yeah. So with orphanages, sometimes she even contacts some orphanages and they tell that they are okay with clothing. But mm. then you will never hear an orphanage saying that they have enough food yeah. stock. Yeah. yeah, so getting food to orphanages is also like a top priority for me because I live around the domain market area. Mm. Sometimes I talk to the market women a lot to okay. also give out their supplies to these orphanages. And then there's one onion seller who doubles as an evangelist in the market. And okay. she tells me that she always does this thing. I think every Friday she goes about soliciting for food for an orphanage. Okay. So they, you know, the market women, they all give yeah, the little give, that they yeah. can. And then at the end of the day, they take it to the orphanage. Yeah. Okay. So. In cases where we cannot do it ourselves, we also talk to other stakeholders oh, okay. also actually get involved. So what are some of the other challenges you face with orphanages? Are there orphanages that you go to and they say, oh, we don't want anything? Maybe there's something, maybe the situation is really, really bad, but they are not willing to accept any kind of help. Is there something like that usually? No, we have not encountered such okay. a situation. But there is the problem of, um, you know, Ghana, getting data is a bit yeah. difficult. So we plan on having extra, you know how Uber, you type or Google Maps, like mm -hmm. you know where every restaurant is, you know. So we're trying yeah. to like map those places so that when people also want to donate items to orphanages mm -hmm. with their items and whatever their yeah. mandate is, they know where to go. Okay. Because let's say if you go to the, I think, New Life Orphanage around Nungwa, Sometimes you go there and then they tell you that they already have enough clothes and books, yes. but what they need is food. Okay. So if you have just food, you know where to take it. Yeah. If you have clothes, you know where to take it. Okay. So we're trying to actually map and then document like mm -hmm. orphanages in areas and things. Because, you know, people in Ghana, are, it's part of our culture. People yeah. like to give. Yeah. But just that sometimes they don't know where to give. Yes. So sometimes our would be there, would get calls from groups or organizations who want to actually embark on a, do a donation project just that yeah. they don't know where to go. And even sometimes on people on their bed, they yes, call me, yes. oh, I want to give this to this orphanage. Can you recommend a place where I can take it? Yeah, so we actually need to get enough data. Mm -hmm. But it's like, 
what I realized that it's like almost every time I'm recommending the same six or seven. Yes. But then they are in Ghana, they are, they are way more. I believe yeah. there are over 200 orphanages in this Akai yeah, alone. That's true. Yeah, so we just need to document them and they know who is where okay. and what they need. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you very much. So, yes, lastly, let's come to the menstrual health project. Yeah. So, what and what is the menstrual health project about? And what inspired it? Because I know menstrual health is a bit of a sensitive topic. Yeah. And especially even with the fact that there has been some battle about taxes being placed on menstrual products. Why did the Brittany Tichy Foundation take this up? So um, menstrual health, uh, our menstrual health project, we basically want to end period poverty by ensuring that young girls and women have easy access to sanitary products and also <laughs> It's affordable for yes. them. So with the menstrual health, it dates back to 2020. Mm -hmm. It dates back to 2020. I think I read an article somewhere on how some people are unable to afford sanitary yeah. pads and then also reading about it. And then we just picked it up right yeah. away that this one, it can't wait. If yeah. we don't, there are other organizations doing it, but then... Look at the number of women and girls around yes. you. And this is not like a once in a month yeah. issue. It's like a lifetime. Yes. So many of us. So yeah, we actually took it up and then we started the advocacy and then soliciting for the tax to be waived. Yeah. Well, I think currently there's about 33% tax on okay. menstrual health yeah. products. And then there are tax that's luxury items, which yeah. to me... That doesn't make sense. There's nothing luxurious about no, menstruating, no, like no. nothing. So yeah, so, that's actually yeah, the problem. You said you were soliciting for the taxi wave. How has that been going? How difficult has it been as well? There's been protests. Mm -hmm. There was a special protest in okay. front of parliament just yes. for sanitary pass, mm -hmm. the tax to calm down. And then they raised the issue of importation taxes and other things. Yes. But then recently at first, we held the view that most of the Sanitary parts are well, imported. Oh, like, no, they they are, imported. most of them are okay. imported. But we have brands in Ghana. I thought they manufacture Yeah, we them actually here. have brands that manufacture, I think, about two or three brands. And they are actually still on the same pricing yes. level as the imported ones. So how is this a tax issue? Yeah. So, you know, for me, I think, well, it's not that I think. It is a profitable business. Yes, like, it is. There's nothing you needing can, something yeah. like this every month. Yeah. Of course, this is so something to, to make me, money from. To me, at, at a point, I feel like we should even stop backlashing government and go on the companies that yes. produce this stuff. But of course, the government is the regulatory body, so they also have to play a role. Yeah, yes, because if they put, let's say, a ban on taxation on you know these sanitary products. That's then the companies would also be forced because nah, well, if they, you don't well, reduce it. <laughs> no, if you don't comply, maybe there could be some down. sanctions yeah. or shutting you down and things yeah. like that. So, yes, you embarked on a menstrual health project just recently. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about how it went? So um, this year, we've actually had two so far. Okay. We've had the annual pass campaign, which we do on World Menstrual Health and Hygiene Day every year, which is 28th May. So. Okay. Sometimes it's falls within school day, so we just shifted back to a school day because okay. you do, we do with students and you yeah. want them to be in school. And then we had the Empower Hair Pass Drive, which is actually the first of its kind. So with the World Menstrual Hygiene Day, we went to OT region, Kwame Kru, okay. to actually educate them on menstrual hygiene and then also donate sanitary pass to them. Okay. And then with the Empower Hair, Hair Pass Drive, we went to um, a man pig here. <laughs> It's wow. around Bodh, yes. It's actually in Greater Accra. Oh, wow. Yes. There's a place in Accra called Imam Penya. Yeah, Imam Penya. <laughs> wow. So, uh, when we went, the headmaster was actually telling us that they actually share a close border with Central Region and okay. then Eastern Region. Because it's not far from Asama and Kese. Okay. And then it's also not far from Bodh, yes, which is okay. the Central Region. Okay. And then the school is actually so in Greater okay. Greta Accra. And that place, like, uh, we have had about Ten menstrual health hygiene projects since 2021, and okay. in Mampia, is like shocker. Wow! Like shocker. What like, was the shocker? We want like, to know. Like, like, like. Sometimes when I think about, it, I still get goosebumps. Oh, what was on there? Cause so in the course of, well, let me talk about how I actually heard of the school. So after mm -hmm. the parts campaign in Uti yeah, region. Okay. A lady reached out to one of the teachers there that, mm -hmm. oh, they also have 
a very serious problem regarding menstrual health okay. issues in their school. And for like a week after past mm -hmm. campaign, and then for us, it's like past campaign is once in a year. Yeah, so, so as in where we... <laughs> so, 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 and then I was like, so initially I told them that, okay, I'll refer them to other organizations mm -hmm. who may be able to help. And then later we sat there and we're like, okay, so what if no organization too is willing yes. to? We can't just say as mm -hmm. and when we can. So we just put up a project right away. And then we actually got a fully funded, a fully sponsored project. Okay. So we get to Iman Peng here, and then the headmaster, who is very, like, so far, he's been one of the men that we've met mm -hmm. on school campus, who was also very passionate about menstrual health education, because he was even, like, sometimes he takes money out of his own pocket to buy sanitary pads for oh, the girls. Okay. But there, he said there's actually a high rate of girls not coming to school when they are menstruating. Oh, in 2024? Yeah, they don't show up at all. He said oh. they don't show up at all. And you know how a period square in SHS? Sometimes you get your period and you realize that it's not just it's the whole yeah. dorm. So it's just, it's like, ah, he said, they started studying patterns that sometimes like half of the class, yeah. the girls are not in school for yeah, one so particular week. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then they also got to, got to boil it down to not having sanitary pads. Yes. So we had a day, but we spoke to about um, 70 girls mm -hmm. from lower primary to upper primary. And then... The, co the, the conversations were shocking. Like, they do not know how to calculate their cycle. menstrual cycle. Oh and these people have been menstruating for, like, five, between one to five years. They do not know how to calculate their menstrual cycle. They had very less or little knowledge about it. And mm -hmm. then the sanitary pads, like, 80% of them did not use sanitary pads. What were they using? Rags. Rags? Yes. So wait, are they clean rags, at least? No. Oh my goodness. So they were using rags and then so we, we we actually had like even though the project was supposed to be about two hours, which is mm -hmm. we spent about six hours there. Wow. Yes. Six hours. Yeah, we spent about six hours there. Okay. So rags and then you know old Ghanaian, my mother used mm -hmm. to tell me that previously when they were kids, that in Toma. So it's mm -hmm. like okay. they cut it for you and then when you, you are menstruating. Okay, you use that. Yeah, you use that. So but then for we re so when we dug deep into it, we realized that, no, they were using rags, and some of them were repeating sanitary pads. Re yeah. Repeating? Repeating sanitary pads. As in, do they wash it? They just load it again? L load it? They use it? No, like... Two days so straight. Oh, goodness. And then... And then, <laughs> so... We, so we were telling them that they should. So there was a conversation on how to change pads yes. and then like watch if it's a light flow, heavy flow, the different types of okay. pads. And they were telling them that there's the heavy flow, mm -hmm. there's the light one, and then we were telling them that they should change their pads four to between every four to six hours mm -hmm. and also bathing twice yes. or three times a day. And then one, one girl asked that, Madam, please, what if you have only one pant? Oh. And then I was taken aback. So I asked her to repeat the question. And then she repeated it. Like for me, one pant. One pant. And then the teacher was like, ah, you one pant. Also, some don't have at all. And I'm like, how do they menstruate? And could you believe that people actually do free flow? I don't know if you know what free yeah, flow is. Yeah, I've, I've seen a little bit of it on yeah. the social media where they just, they don't wear anything. Yeah, they, they just it, allow it. This one is not a lifestyle. Though. It's, this is somebody's life. That is somebody's life because they don't have, they can't afford. Wow. They do free flow. They don't wear any sanitary pads at all. And so, and it's just like, some of them don't even have underwear. That if we had come during break mm. hours, that one, we would have seen it for ourselves because when they jump up and come down, oh. there's nothing there. And this is in Accra. This is in Accra. So... Oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah. Also, this, 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 is, this is this is a lot to take yeah. in. Yeah. Well, and honestly, on behalf of all the women <laughs> probably watching, all the women here, all the women in Ghana, we yeah. thank you for this project because even hearing, yeah, it's it's, it's that bad <laughs> out there. <laughs> wow. Okay. So, aside having to do you do you go down to the basics of teaching them how to use it? Yes. So it means that you you are going to basically be teaching them the integrated science, reproductive yeah. health. You know, most people mm -hmm. don't 
most teachers actually skip it. They be like, yes. oh, you, you menstruate already. You so already know. Okay. When they, you know when they get to reproduction, yes. maybe you know that, that. And then, then they, they just they... skip to the next topic. And most children, for me, the shocker was they not being able to calculate their cycle. Yes. And I was like, but that is in the textbook. People, do, they don't even know the average length and then the maximum length yeah. of the cycle. So we asked them, so how do you know your period is coming? Oh, it just comes. <laughs> Any day it comes. So we actually, we, we have like a manual, which is actually okay. now in PowerPoint slides, okay. where we have like the whole integrated science process. Yes. We have like menarche to menopause. Yes. We have the different alternatives. Okay. So for, you have pamphlets and things you share for Yes, them. we have okay. different alternatives for parts, which we have the tampons, the menstrual cups, yeah. and then the reusable parts, parts, and okay. then the, and even right now, there's the, period panty yeah, where okay. you just dispose okay so and also with the we've had concerns have been raised that oh would it not be better to introduce the reusable pass yeah. since they can't afford with the reusable pass the thing um the concern is on hygiene yes hygiene Washing and maintenance and, yeah. yes and even that one to me you still need quite a number almost as same as you yeah. would use when you are buying a normal, well, just that you get to reuse yes, it the following month. Yes. So are the reusable pads something that like, if you use it today and you wash it and you use, uh, you take another one, then tomorrow you can use it or you need to dry it and air it out for a very long time? It has to like, it has to, you see, that is why I have like, I also have a problem with the hygiene. Okay. Like it has to dry. Okay. Not just anywhere, it has to dry in sunlight. Yes, in sunlight. And also they're washing, you cannot just use any soap to yes. wash it. It shouldn't be strong. Mm. It should be like very mild. Yes. So there's, and these, you are dealing with children. Yes. So okay. you have to. The next thing you know, down. somebody's using Omo to wash it. Yeah. Yeah. And then giving herself more Infections. issues. Yeah. Okay. This has been a very, very interesting conversation. And I'm sure we'll have you again because <laughs> these projects are very important. And I'm, yeah. I'm so glad we have you here to tell us about it. And so. I have one more question about, I, I think I should have asked earlier, but about accountability, how do you maintain, how are you able to make sure that you're accountable to your team and even to the public? The public. So um, what we do is we run accounts on every project that mm -hmm. we do. So with every project, we have the budget. Okay. Then there is the Momo statement okay. that is of funds that came in for the project and after we have the expense sheet okay sometimes we go all the way to sharing with with the appropriate okay whether it's sponsors or mm -hmm. maybe so you know with craft, craft we, we actually it, have yeah. to have it to actually publish it on yeah. our websites for as part of our annual okay. report but then sometimes because we've had a few projects sponsored by fully sponsored by individuals mm -hmm. we for us, we will send you the breakdown. We will okay. send you photocopies of all the receipts. Yeah. I want to tell people that, me, if you want, I, we can come with you, especially when we are going to buy things. Yeah, so that you see everything. Every, everybody knows. So it's like, even if you call this person in yeah. anyone's absence, they can actually give you a breakdown of okay. what we bought. And anytime we buy, we buy something, we take receipts. Okay. Okay. For places where they don't have receipts, we have our own receipt book. Okay, then so you write it. So you too. write it, you sign, you put your number there. And I told them, <laughs> some people are like, ah, I did three to the super receipts. So Shit. it's not for me. <laughs> that, that should be, be, be our best friend. Yeah. You know, it's their for number. Yeah. So in the future, someone can call you to make okay. reference to this. Mm. Yeah, so for me, accountability is actually very much needed because sometimes well, just a little inconsistencies with mm -hmm. accounting can mar your yeah, whole image as yeah. a person and as an organization so for me we are very big on accountability like okay. letting everyone know how a single person was spent was yes. spent okay, yeah that's very great so what should we expect from the Ritney Tichi Foundation going forward? And even when is your next project, especially the menstrual health one? I mean, that one has my heart. <laughs> then also the orphanage drive. When are your next projects okay. coming in? For the menstrual health drive, we would have a project in, we're actually planning this project for either October or November. Okay. And then for back to school, too, we're actually supposed to have one in September, okay. early or ending of September, and then the orphanage drive would be December, December during yes. the Christmas festivities. Okay, okay. Um, going forward, we're actually working on putting up um, 
a structure, which is a shelter. Okay. We are working on getting um, property to actually set up okay. a shelter because I've realized that in Ghana, it is actually very rare or scarce mm -hmm. to actually find a shelter. And then right now, that is like one of the challenges. Because if you go out after 9 p.m., yes. the number of children you see on the street. Oh. For me, I school at Accra Tech University, former poly. Yes. When I went to school in the first year, I didn't, anything, I didn't know anything about to do life. Yes. So I think I was sick one night and I know there's a pharmacy at to do. There was 9 p.m. So I just got out through the back gate and even the security man was like, Where are you going? I was like, Oh, me to a driver. He was like, Hey, by this time. Mm. And I was like, Oh, I really need it, so let me go and come. The number of people that had lined up, like sleeping, it's like they are just sleeping by the, by the road. Oh. So it's like in the nights, if like there's lights off and there's a trailer who also doesn't know his way oh, about him to do, kill people. He would actually run about. And honestly, I counted over 150 people. Wow. Men, women, children. And you know, some people have actually slept and left their kids. Ah, and their kids are probably playing, awake yeah. playing. And then I'm like, somebody can literally just come and grab your child oh. and go. So I, I, I got back and then I called my father and he was like, wow, that is a cry life. Welcome. Wow. Yeah, so like for me, I feel there's actually the need for a shelter. A shelter yes. If the parents don't want to come, like these children, they are innocent. Yes. They, they have no idea. Yeah. They do not drive themselves okay. into it. So at least if we cannot get parents or mm -hmm. coming in, at least we can we get can the get young the kids, people. Yes. And then actually put them in school and then try to yes. develop... The thing is that for these things, most people, they need them. But then if you don't go to them yeah, and talk they, to them about they it, they won't also come for They won't also come for it because they, for they, they are struggling for what to eat, maybe yes. for morning before they think of afternoon. Yes. So they don't have the, the luxury to think of long-term yeah. goals. So I asked my father that, so like um, the little children, to, is that how they grow up? And he was like, well, they're going to become the track yeah. pushers and car oh. you see around. That if no one helps yes. them. Okay. Yeah, so going forward, we are trying to make more, more concrete um, mm. and permanent fixtures for okay. them and also liaising with more orphanages. Sometimes you get a call, oh, they found a child here. And mostly my only report is carry the child to the police station. Oh, there's nowhere to keep the like, child Like, for safe. me, I can't, I can't keep the child anywhere. So please yeah. take the child to the police station and then let social welfare take over. Yeah. But then if I knew of places that would accept yeah. these children, I could actually follow yes. up after the police station. We then, make the report yeah. and then we work with social welfare, okay. get them back into the... Their society. Yeah, society. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so so much. Yeah, so, what are your closing remarks for our viewers, everybody watching, everybody out there, for Brittany Techi Foundation's fans and you yeah. know supporters? Yeah. Um. So we thank everyone for their support so far, and then we encourage that people donate to um, good causes such as nonprofit mm -hmm. and also be very um, integrated in the society. Because if I was not integrated in my society and didn't know what was happening around me, this wouldn't yeah. have been. I would have just gone on living life as yeah. a regular person. Detached. Yeah, but then the more you get ingrained in your society, you know that these things are happening yeah. and then you're, able, you're also able to take like good courses on how to help them. And you don't really have to also get up as an NGO. You can help out at church. Churches yes. do these things, caring for the needy. You can also volunteer. And you can simply be a good sportsman in the community. Yes, report whatever true. you have to report. Yes. It doesn't always have to be a formalized structure. Mm -hmm. Like every bit, like counts, every one yes. pound counts, yeah. Okay, thank you so, so thank much you. for granting us this opportunity to interact with you. Yeah, and welcome. we hope to see you again very, very soon. Certainly. Maybe I can beg my producers and directors to join you in your coverage for one of your drives maybe all of them you Certainly. know you never know <laughs> greatly appreciate it <laughs> thank so, you so yes, much so yes this this brings us to the end of the coco digest morning show and a big thank you to you first of all my cherished viewers for staying with us throughout and a big thank you to our sponsors a big thank you to the technical team our management all of this would not have been a success without you we hope to see you again on Thursday morning, bright and early. Do have a blessed day.
clogged TV. Beyond the Policy